Energy, Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee will come to order. It's Monday, March 27th, 2023, 1230 p.m. We're in room 1150 of the Minnesota Senate building, and a quorum is present. Members, we're going to take up Senate file 2847 today, but first we must pick it up off the table. Senator Zhang moves that Senate file 2847 be picked up off the table. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Bill is back up off the table. We also have members the A-10 amendment. Um, have council explain that very briefly, please, before we offer it. Mr. Chair, members, the uh, A-10 makes four changes to the bill. On uh, lines three and four, it uh, corrects an incorrect uh, dollar amount. Line five, remove some language that was inadvertently left in that would have required the bill to go to state and local government. On the rest of the lines, uh, seven through 11, these are correcting definitions in entities that are eligible for grants under the school bus grants, the electric school bus grant. Uh, program as well as under the grid resiliency grant program. Thank you very much, Mr. Stanley. Members, questions, observations to the A-10 amendment? Seeing none, all in favor of adoption of the A-10 amendment signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The A-10 is adopted. Uh, to the bill as amended, um, Senator Matthews, I don't know if you have an amendment you'd like to bring. Senator Matthews. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, staff and council helped identify uh, one more issue that's in the A-12 amendment that I will move. Senator Matthews moves the A-12 amendment. Senator Matthews, to your amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've been told that Mr. Mueller is the one to best explain uh, the issue that they Thank helped you. uncover. Senator Matthews, as we clearly stated, Mr. Mueller will now describe the A-12 amendment. Mr. Mueller. Mr. Chairman and <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members, the A12 amendment requires a report from the uh, Commissioner of Commerce of all the um, balances of the, of accounts in the Special Revenue Fund that are tied to the Energy Chapter. Um, there are a number of grant programs in this bill that has the money going to a special rev an account in the Special Revenue Fund, and this is just asking for a report once a year what the balances are of those accounts. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Anything further to the amendment, Senator Matthews? Members, the author does consider this a friendly amendment. The essence of it is if we're going to appropriate this money, it seems reasonable to ask for reporting. Um, so I'm asking members to vote yes in favor of Senator Matthews' amendment. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of adopting the A-12 amendment, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? The A-12 is adopted. Thank you, Senator Matthews, for contributing to the bill. With that, members, I'm going to hand the gavel over to Senator Zhang and present the bill. Thank you for uh, whoever gave us the M&Ms. There's the M&Ms in your packet. Uh, Senator, Senator Friends, uh, back to your bill, Senate File 2847. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Proud to present to you the Omnibus Energy Utilities Climate and Environment Budget Bill, Senate File 2847, as amended. Mr. Chair and members, we put in a couple months in this committee trying to craft energy policy going forward. I think we've had great discussions. This bill represents our budget priorities. I'm asking for bipartisan support and want to make a couple observations before, Mr. Chair, we go to live testimony. First of all, Senators, we've had a lot of discussion about the impact of our choices on price. You may know that yesterday um, there was information released about the cost of renewable energy and the pace of change in the United States. And I wanted to bring your attention, members, to a couple things. Um, for those that saw it, the U.S. Energy Information Administration puts out an annual report every year telling us how we're doing, what the changes are, and how they're impacting us. And a couple things worth noting in, in this week's report. First of all, for the first time, renewable energy has surpassed both coal and nuclear energy in percentage terms of the nation's energy. So renewables are growing. And the director, uh, and I quote, says, the booming growth is driven largely by economics, in other words, by cost. 
As we've debated in this committee, the impact of wind and solar and other renewable energy, I think members from both parties have rightly said, what is this going to cost ratepayers? And this report tells you a couple things. First of all, that the percentage of renewables is growing. Second of all, that that's driving costs down in many of the states. And for members, um, you know, because we want Minnesota to be the best it can be, a quick comparison of states. In the field of solar, California is now the number one state, followed by Texas. So I hope we can agree those are two states led with different political ideologies, but their adoption of solar is quite similar. The top two states in the United States in the adoption of solar energy right now are California and Texas. And for those who worry that the Midwest may not be the best place for wind and solar, the report also acknowledged that in wind production, Texas is now the number one state in the country, number two being Iowa. And so as we look at our energy policy, please let's be realistic about what the costs are and how that affects our ratepayers. We're trying to create energy policy that decarbonizes our state, but we are not wanting to do that at the expense of today's ratepayers, which of course includes all of us. To the bill, Mr. Chair, for those that have had a chance to look it over, we are appropriating $255 million in general funds for our budget here. We're adding an additional $57 million in renewable development account projects. We'll talk about those in a minute. That's for fiscal year 24 and 25. That's the target that we've been given. We're within the target in the bill in front of you, and it has a number of highlights, which I'm sure we'll get to, but amongst them, pre-weatherization, solar for schools, Natural Gas Innovation Act implementation, thank you, Senator Rarick. Strengthen Minnesota Homes, the Advanced Nuclear Study, thank you, Senator Matthews. The National Sports Center Array, although I see Senator Hoffman's not here, in spirit, he's here. The Clean Energy Resource Team funding, thank you, Senator Dibble. The High Voltage Transmission Line, members will notice that this will not be present to the same extent in the other bodies bill, but this is the line that brings wind energy from North Dakota. This is a budget priority in here, and the reason that it's funded at $17.5 million is that we're asking the state of North Dakota to put up money, we're asking for the federal government to chip in, and we made a pledge to utilities as we put our policy forward that we would be there for the transition, and we have to make transmission one of those priorities. The Tribal Energy Grants. This bill funds and recognizes the language for the Tribal Energy Advisory Council. We should do that. If we're going to be good partners, we have to be good partners for everybody. Minnesota Energy Alley, Residential Electric Upgrade Grants, Climate Innovation Finance Authority. Thank you, Senator Zhang. We have more conversation to have on the so-called Green Bank. We want to take advantage of federal dollars, but we want to do it in a smart, responsible way. And for that, we want to have the input of the Department of Commerce and any of our stakeholders in Minnesota. Electric vehicle rebates, thank you, Senator Mitchell, and electric vehicle auto dealer certification. It's not enough to say that we're going to provide purchase incentives. We have to train Minnesotans to work on those vehicles in the same way we have to provide charging infrastructure. We have the iron ore battery feasibility study. One of the hallmarks of our committee, I think, has been open-mindedness. We have to look at new avenues on battery storage if we want our transition to be a good one. A feasibility study, like the advanced nuclear study, is our way of saying, let's take a look. Maybe there's something uh, there for us to make part of our future, and if so, um, we'll be glad that we, we studied it. The Air Ventilation Program Act grants that we heard on Monday. $13 million for green fertilizer. If there's any members of this committee that represent primarily agricultural districts like me, I ask you to take a good look at green fertilizer production. This has got major upside potential for our energy policy. And then finally, energy guidelines for state buildings and analysis of construction materials. Buildings emit a certain amount of carbon to the extent we can improve will reduce our energy demands. That by itself, of course, reduces the total carbon emissions. I could go on, Mr. Chair, but I think a better approach at this point would be to ask the testifiers to come up and present their testimony. Um, members, I'm asking you to pass this bill out of committee with bipartisan support. I'm open-minded to amendments that fit our philosophy. And with that, Mr. Chair, I see you've got a couple of testifiers on your list. I will mention, Mr. Chair, um, that the staff here is ready to show a sign for a two-minute limit on testimony. I believe um, we have a 30 seconds left sign and a stop sign. And I know, Mr. Chair, it's tough to police those kinds of things in such a fun committee as this, but hopefully we can keep the testimony in person to two minutes each. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Friends. I've been told to use this more. Uh, but uh, first, we have Commissioner Arnold 
and the Executive Secretary, Will Sufert, uh, from the PUC. Commissioner, welcome to the Energy Committee, and you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair Zhang, Senator Friends, members. For the record, my name is Grace Arnold, and I'm the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Commerce. I'm testifying to express the Department's strong support of Senate File 2847, the Climate, Energy, and, Omnibus Bill, uh, Climate and Energy Omnibus Bill. Uh, Senate File 2847 includes important policy and budget items poised to benefit every Minnesotan and to help the Commerce Department to continue with its goal to promote clean, reliable, and affordable energy for Minnesota homes and businesses. I'll just quickly remind you that the Division of Energy Resources within the department serves in regulatory, policy, and programmatic roles. We serve as the Minnesota State Energy Office. We administer both the low-income energy assistance and weatherization programs. We provide environmental review for large-scale energy pro uh, projects. We host the Energy Information Center. We provide energy-related granting and contracting activities. We lead out on energy-related infrastructure investments uh, in, the, uh, in the IAJA and IRA. We oversee Minnesota's Conservation Improvement Program, a nation-leading program, if I don't need to remind you of that. And we advocate on behalf of the public interest in proceedings involving the regulated utilities on energy and telecommunications. We also maintain cross-functional units related to energy reliability, transmission planning, energy resilience, and energy state, uh, state energy security planning. I recognize there are some differences between the governor's budget and this uh, budget, but I'm really grateful to see all of the items included, but I'd like to highlight a few. Uh, the pre-weatherization and workforce training program to provide more services to, addition to income eligible homes throughout Minnesota and improve their health and safety as they're weatherized. Uh, the Strengthen Minnesota Homes program will make homes more resilient to Minnesota's ever-changing climate. Solar for Schools will expand this really popular program to reduce energy costs in schools and serve as a teaching tool for students. My son's uh, elementary school has solar on it, and it's great. It's been a great opportunity to talk about that with him. The ongoing grid reliability assessment to ensure effective state, regional, and national planning efforts are coordinated, and uh, the energy resource and planning funding to be responsive to an increase in the number and complexity of regulatory filings. And finally, continuing agency operations to ensure that we have the capacity to be effective stewards of these resources and invest in our teams and IT. I'd also like to express my gratitude, I see the stop sign, um, <laughs> for including a policy proposal which has a bit of funding here for the Tribal Ed, uh, Advocacy Council on Energy. So uh, thank you for the time um, to invest in the department, to invest in energy security and reliability and um, clean energy in the state of Minnesota, and I encourage you to support this bill. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Supert. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, for the record, Will Seifert, Executive Secretary, Public Utilities Commission. Um, in the interest of time, I will read my comments quickly. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment on Senate File 2847. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission appreciates the hard work of the committee this session. As you know, the commission regulates three cornerstone service industries in Minnesota's economy, electricity, natural gas, and telephone, to ensure that the public receives utility service that is safe, reliable, and affordable. Passage of this budget bill will allow, the, excuse me, will allow the commission to efficiently implement regulatory proceedings with robust public engagement. Over the past decade, the commission's regulatory oversight, especially in electric and gas utilities, has increased in response to market dynamics, evolving utility business models, energy technologies, and state policies. Furthermore, the commission has welcomed an increasing volume of public comments and widespread interest in energy issues. At the same time, the work required to fulfill the Commission's traditional regulatory responsibilities has become increasingly challenging as energy utilities implement new programs and the energy industry transitions toward a cleaner, more connected, and more complex grid. Recent major federal and regional actions will have a significant impact on PUC activities. These include passage of the IRA, IIJA, and the MISO Long Range Transmission Project, Tranche 1 projects. These historic initiatives include significant investments in the energy system and have the potential for widespread ratepayer benefits and carbon reduction. This budget will allow the agency to manage the various proceedings required to implement these acts. Oversight of the utilities is vital in ensuring that service is re safe, reliable, and affordable, and maximizing the benefit realized by Minnesota ratepayers. 
Just a brief note on, uh, on the policy article, as the commission doesn't traditionally take positions on policy measures before the legislature, I do want to just note um, the commission has raised concerns this session regarding the proposed expansion of automatic recovery mechanisms, also known as riders for utility cost recovery. We appreciate that these provisions have been largely omitted from the Senate version of the bill, but do want to flag that in its current form, this bill does authorize automatic recovery for expenses related to EV school bus infrastructure. We also note that there are significant changes to electric vehicle programs and solar garden programs proposed in both the House and the Senate. Both of these issues are very complicated and we look forward to ser serving as a resource for the committees in this, on this language to ensure that the final outcome is something that we can effectively implement. In closing, we want to thank the members of the committee for their hard work this session. Thank you for considering our feedback and please continue to use us as a resource as you work on this legislation going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have President Johnson from the Prairie Island Indian Community and uh, Mr. Chris Clark. President Johnson. Mr. Chair and members, how midakiapi, mitawa kodapi, chante washte na pe chiyuzapi, we ohanta sampa washte. I just said in my language, good afternoon, and I welcome you with a good heart and a warm handshake. My name is Johnny Johnson, I'm president of the Prairie Island. Indian community. I'm here today to testify in the matter that of great importance to my tribe, which has been recent public policy impact that we are asking your help with. As you may know, the Prairie Island nuclear plant went into operation in 1973, adjacent our reservation. No one told us what was coming. There was no due diligence done on how this was, what this would affect our small and struggling community located on the same island. <laughs> the tribe did not have resources to ask questions of the company or engaged in any process, even though the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs has a legal responsibility to protect the tribe. It failed to do that. We were forgotten. Our impoverished relatives, including my father, who worked on the construction of the plant, given the lack of economic opportunities at that time, they did not know they were helping to build a nuclear plant that would, be, that would be dealing with for decades. The plant was put into operation with the idea that the federal government would construct a national repository for the nuclear waste. As we all know, there was a site in Nevada Yucca Mountain. That was designated, designated by the federal government for nuclear waste. Yucca Mountain never became viable despite millions of dollars spent. So in 1994, the Minnesota legislators authorized dry cast storage at Tinta Winta, which means Prairie Island in our Dakota language. This time, the tribe adamantly opposed, but it was passed despite our concerns. As part of the legislation, the tribe was named a third party beneficiary of the agreement between the state and Excel Energy. The agreement was renegotiated in 2003 when it became clear that even more cast would be needed on site at the Prairie Island nuclear plant. 
As part of the renegotiation, Excel agreed to pay Tinta Winta $2.5 million annually. To this day, we are the closest community to a nuclear power plant and spent nuclear waste in the country. But we do not receive the typical financial support of a host community and have no choice but to bear the responsibility for our community members' health and safety. The surrounding communities have received hundreds of millions of dollars from placement of nuclear plant on Tinta Winta. For example, the city of Red Wing received over $232 million in tax revenue through 2021 only. Going forward, they will receive a hundred, uh, hundreds of millions more. Because of the shift in state policies to move to 100% carbon-free energy, the life of the nuclear plant will be likely extended. Due to this anticipation of relicensure, we have been working on an updated arrangement with Excel. We would like the legislator to authorize it. It would increase payments to the tribe to generally, generally track with the surrounding community's tax revenue, such as Red Wing. This would recognize the burden we bear and the needs for resources to provide safety <coughs> to my community. To be clear, relicensing is a major issue for our community and, the one, and one that causes us fear. The plant and waste sits on our sacred island, Tinta Winta, less than 700 yards from our people. The livelihood and uh, of our people and livelihood and over our objections. And as a result, the state has enjoyed base load carbon reduced energy since the early 1970s. We are now facing at least another additional 20 years of operation beyond what the plant was intended for. Until 2053 and 2054, our burden and risk grows for our next generation. Therefore, we believe that it is only right that the current agreement should be updated to reflect the burden that the tribe carries. I look forward to any discussions on this issue, Mr. Chair and Committee. I say Wopi Latanka from the Prairie Island Indian Community and myself as President for getting this opportunity to speak in front of you. Aho. Thank you, President Johnson. You, uh, next, we have Mr. Chris Clark. Clark. Okay. All right. All right. So, well done. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to appear before you. Thank you, Chair Friends, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. On behalf of Excel Energy, I want to express that we are honored to have been welcomed by President Johnson and the Tribal Council to engage with them. I've met with them regularly since I became president. President Johnson and his predecessor and their council have warmly welcomed us, treated us with respect, and we have shared discussions about our history, uh, even though much of that is tough and, and shares stories that they know are important for us to hear and understand uh, to understand what it's like to be the community uh, living next to our nuclear plant. As President Johnson said, the continued operation of that plant is important to the state being able to achieve its 100 percent by 2040 goal. We at Excel are excited to pursue that and excited to support that, but it does come with a burden on the Prairie Island Indian community 
uh, and we want to address that agreement, as President Johnson said, so that uh, we may proceed treating the community <clears throat> like we treat our other neighboring communities, that they will have the funds to invest in their community, in their infrastructure, in their housing, in their workforce, and in their future generations. We also have worked with them and intend to continue working with them to support bringing additional lands uh, into their sovereign nation uh, so that they have additional options for their community. Uh, we're proud of the work we did. I want to just quickly address the timing. We apologize for coming at Excel. We apologize for coming to you late in the session with this. Obviously, it would have been great if we could have been here in January, but we have worked hard with the Prairie Island Indian community to achieve this agreement. It was important that we respect that process, that the community have the opportunity to share with their members what we were working on and to get their input. And I've had the opportunity as well to hear from their community members. So we look forward to bringing this to you now. We appreciate your consideration of this and we would appreciate inclusion of this as the legislature continues its work throughout the session. As I said, I believe that this agreement is an appropriate way for us to recognize the burdens that the tribe deals with with our plant. We obviously work very hard to operate a safe plant. We also want to be a good neighbor and help the Prairie Island Indian community uh, be able to invest in its community and its future. Thank you very much for your consideration here. I look forward to, as President Johnson said, engaging with you and, and answering any questions or concerns that you may have. Thank, thank you again. Thank you, thank you President Clark. Uh, Senator <clears throat> Friends. First of all, Mr. Chair and members, this is what we're doing here, is to try to bring people together and try to find solutions to issues. Um, both of these gentlemen were a little too humble. What's taken place recently, and the reason for the timing, is the work that the Prairie Island community did in talking to its members about this agreement and trying to find consensus. And for our friends at XL, they were patient and a, a collaborative partner. I've spoken with the ranking member, Senator Matthews, about this. I realize the language of an agreement is not in the bill before you, but very soon we will be bringing to this committee an opportunity to share with you what I think you'll find is a very appropriate resolution and to have all of you have the ability to have input. But um, while we work on hundreds of pages of bills this session and proud of it, I think you'll see this will be a bipartisan solution that everyone on the committee will be proud of, and it'll be in the name of the people in the Prairie Island community and all Minnesotans, and I will bring that to you as soon as we can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Frentz, for those comments, as well as uh, President Johnson and Mr. Clark uh, for sharing. Uh, on this agreement, and uh, I've had uh, both Excel uh, and Prairie Island uh, in my office in the last couple of days, both sharing uh, their sides and, and uh, what they view the agreement, and it looks uh, positive um, all the way around. I've looked at the, at least the first draft of what uh, the, the language of a bill or an amendment would look like, and I think that it's a really good uh, start. I haven't fully digested it, but nothing jumps out as concerning uh, to me initially. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it would be worthy of being run through as a standalone bill. And I've mentioned that to uh, Chair Frentz. Uh, I think that's something that we could uh, clearly show um, where there is a, a strong area of bipartisanship for to get that done. I know we're past deadline but the majority has ways to get it through Rules Committee, and there's a number of uh, ways to still get uh, the bill through. And I think that would be preferable than sticking it uh, into uh, a large package and figure out how you negotiate out of there, and then it's bogged down with uh, every other issue with how members feel on it. So I want to put uh, my two cents in on that as well. Uh, appreciate Senator Friends for... Uh, committing to bringing this to the committee here, and uh, I think we can have a really good, uh, a really good pathway forward uh, to help get this agreement, uh, the legislative side of it, passed into law, so that we can uh, move forward with uh, the next phase of energy generation under the 
100% bill and the need to relicense our nuclear plants. Thank you, Senator Matthews, and uh, thank you both uh, for your testimony. Um, next, we will have uh, Kevin Prannis and Joel Johnson. Uh, Mr. Prentice, uh, please state your name and you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Zhang and committee members. Uh, I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, on behalf of Lyona, Minnesota, North Dakota, Kevin Prentice, I want to say this is an excellent bill and I want to thank uh, all of the committee members and staff who worked on it. Uh, I want to first uh, begin expressing appreciation for the committee's efforts to strengthen labor standards across a number of program areas, including the Climate Innovation Finance Authority, electric school bus deployment, electric panel upgrades, uh, solar on uh, public buildings, and all projects funded for the renewable development account. I think there's a recognition that clean energy jobs should be just as good as conventional energy jobs, and that's reflected in this bill, and also a recognition that the peer-reviewed research shows that these can be done without additional cost and substantial public benefits. Second, I uh, want committee members to know that, uh, as, as you know, we strongly advocated for 100% clean energy. We believe those goals can be met, but only if we give utilities the flexibility and tools needed to meet the goals reliably and affordably. We think this bill does it with critical tools, ranging from grants to tribal nations and electric cooperatives, funds for critically needed transmission uh, uh, for MP, to, uh, to funds to study advanced nuclear and battery storage technologies, which will be needed to get the last 10 or 20% done. And increased flexibility, I think the modernization of the community solar uh, program is critically important and a huge accomplishment uh, in this bill, reducing costs at, and raising labor standards at the same time, bringing more transparency and addressing inequities in the current program. And finally, uh, we appreciate the inclusion of buy clean electric vehicle, de vehicle deployment and green fertilizer. Uh, on intervener compensation, uh, the current bill does not reflect uh, very diligent work between the Citizens Utility Board and ourselves uh, to figure out how to maximize the benefits and minimize risks of the program, but we look forward to that coming forward soon and appreciate the work by Cub. And finally, we'd like to strongly endorse the comments of uh, President Johnson and Mr. Clark. Uh, we believe that we have a moral ob obligation to support redress for the Prairie Island Indian community, not just with words, but with resources. We believe the Renewable Development Account would be an appropriate source of funds. There is no path to 100% without the Prairie Island, Island nuclear plant, and there is no path there that's fair to the community without addressing the, their concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prentice. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Please state your name and you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joel Johnson I'm with the IBEW State Council, um, and I'm here to uh, express our strong support for uh, Senate File 28, uh, 47. Um, in addition to uh, providing a down payment on the infrastructure we're going to need uh, to meet the new 100% clean energy standard, um, this bill also recognizes the vital role that workers will play in our energy transition. Our members build, maintain, uh, and maintain the electric grid across the state and understand the task ahead of us. Uh, the funding in this bill represents a lot of work for our members, and we look forward to getting started. We'd also like to thank uh, Chair Frentz for recognizing the value of a properly trained workforce, both in making sure that the work is done properly and most importantly, safely. Uh, the prevailing wage provisions in, the, uh, in this bill will also make sure that workers are paid a fair wage and share in the growing uh, clean energy sector. One of the big challenges for meeting the new 100% clean energy standard is that so many of the technologies that we're go going to need still need to develop. The bill's investments in solar, storage, hydrogen, and advanced nuclear study could help guide our approach in the years ahead. We do have concerns with the uh, remaining with the PUC inter intervener proposal. While we support efforts to include more voices uh, in procedures at the PUC, particularly those advocating on behalf of low-income consumers, we would like to see a sunset date or a pilot program designation so legislators can uh, evaluate whether this program is working as hoped. Otherwise, uh, we strongly urge, uh, support this bill and urge your, urge your support as well. Thank you. Uh, Chair Friends. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Johnson. Just on the point about the sunset, uh, Mr. Pranis has already left, but that is very much a part of the discussion on the intervener comp negotiations, and a sunset uh, is very much in the mix of what they're working on. While those negotiations are not finished, I'm somewhat confident that that'll be a part of the final deal, and just wanted to throw that out there, Mr. Chair. And thank you again, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, can we have Abby Hornberger and Brian Cook? Hello, Ms. Hornberger. Uh, please state your name and you can begin your testimony. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Abby Hornberger. I'm the Minnesota Policy Organizer for the Blue Green Alliance and a member of USW Local 2002. I'm here today to celebrate and uplift the inclusion of the Buy Clean, Buy Fair Minnesota Act in this committee's omnibus bill. This bill would establish a environmental standards and procurement task force to ensure that stakeholders such as state agencies, industry, labor unions, environmental stakeholders, and environmental justice organizations are at the table as an environmental product decoration system comes to play for evaluating state procurement in contracts. The task force will determine the materials subject to program requirements, consider the financial implications of the law on businesses, set parameters for greenhouse gas standards, and schedule the implementation of the standards. Work is already being done by the Minnesota Department of Transportation and the Department of Commerce, and working closely with stakeholders such as the University of Minnesota Center for Sustainable Building Research um, to move forward with EPDs as the industry norm. Additionally, a pilot program would be developed by 2024 to gather data from vendors and understand current supply levels and emissions. We thank you for including the Buy Clean um, Act in this omnibus bill and urge you to vote yes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Hornberger. Uh, Mr. Cook. Great. Mr. Chair, Chair Friends, members of the Energy Utilities, Environment, and Climate Committee. My name is Brian Cook. I'm the Director of Energy Policy for the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber, which represents over 6,300 businesses of all sizes with more than 500,000 employees, believes in a triple goal of affordable, reliable, and cleaner energy. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of our thoughts on Senate File 2847. First off, we appreciate Chair Friends and the staff's willingness to listen to our perspective as they have developed this bill. We support the inclusion of the advanced nuclear study. As our state continues its transition towards more renewable forms of energy, nuclear can play a key role as a source of carbon-free baseload power, and the study can help steer the legislature's decision-making in the future. We also wish to share some concerns with this bill. Electricity prices for Minnesota businesses and families are, increasingly rap are increasing rapidly, and they're increasing faster than the national average. Since 2002, the average cost for large electric users nationwide has grown by 42 percent. In that same time frame, the cost in Minnesota has grown by 91 percent. What used to be a competitive advantage for Minnesota companies has disappeared. We are failing to meet some of our state's electricity cost goals. My testimony is also not focused on whether some of the spending programs in the bill are a good idea or a bad idea. Instead, the focus is on the funding mechanism, which is customers' electric bills. The bill would spend tens of millions of dollars out of the renewable development account. The RDA is funded by a specific tax that only XL Energy customers pay, established as part of a negotiated agreement to license nuclear facilities in Minnesota. Spending out of the RDA is spending utility customer money. The bill also contains electric vehicle infrastructure provisions that are funded through cost recovery that comes directly out of customer electric bills. This budget bill utilizes these mechanisms in ways that could cumulatively cost hundreds of millions of dollars for utility customers and will cause additional upward pressure on the prices that they pay every single month. Briefly, I would also like to voice again our concerns with the energy benchmarking mandate. Minnesota is already a highly regulated and expensive state in which to conduct business. This proposal would add additional costs and burden burdens when building owners have other financial and environmental incentives to reduce their own energy use. The cost trends for electricity in the state are concerning, and we hope as this bill makes its way to the governor's desk, a little bit more can be done to ensure Minnesotans are not asked to pay more than they can afford. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Mr. Kent Solom and Marcus Mills. Mr. Sillum, uh, please state your name and you may begin. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sillum with the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. And on behalf of our 124 electric utilities and 33 gas utilities, I want to thank Senator Frentz and the committee for putting forth a good and balanced bill. 
contains a number of provisions such as uh, that'll help with things such as pre-weatherization, weatherization funding. It will help with conservation efforts. It also contains incentive towards beneficial electrification and money towards improving transmission. Another provision that we are very pleased to see in the bill is the funding for an in-depth study on nuclear power. MMUA believes that a true all of the above approach to decarbonization needs to hear the pros, cons, and feasibility of all sources of clean energy, including nuclear power. So of course, we're very happy to see the extra funding uh, for communities and co-ops to assist in our transition to cleaner energy while maintaining reliable, affordable, and sustainable services for our customers and communities. Finally, I want to thank Senator Friends for uh, not loading the bill up with numerous new reporting requirements on our small communities. Such reporting uh, requirements frequently prove costly, time-consuming, and seldom provide any truly new or uh, beneficial information. We thank Senator Friends for having an open door. I know at least one of our power agencies uh, has submitted some merchant testimony, making a few suggestions to take this good bill and make it even better. We look forward to working with Chair Friends and the rest of you as this bill moves forward. We hope to see a nearly identical bill come back from conference committee. Thank you. Um, next, Mr. Mills, please state your name and you may begin your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chair, uh, Senators. Uh, my name is Marcus Mills. Um, I work with Community Power and I want to uh, thank Senator Friends and uh, Senator Zhang for bringing uh, a great deal of uh, this forward. Uh, we appreciate the hard work and time that has been put into uh, discussions related to energy, um, environmental justice, and the future of the workplace. We are uh, disappointed in the small target of $255 million assigned to uh, climate and energy um, at a time of climate crisis and in the face of pervasive ongoing environmental injustice, Minnesota will be missing an opportunity to uh, address climate change, access new federal funds for clean energy, and support the communities most impacted by environmental injustices, particularly uh, BIPOC communities, low-income households, and rural Minnesotans. We urge you to ask for additional funding to fund many of the best bills that were uh, not included in the omnibus bill or were included at low levels of funding. Um, there are good policies included in this bill. We applaud the inclusion of resiliency design uh, guidelines for building adaptations to uh, projected uh, climate change. Um, Requirements to pay prevailing wages on construction projects that receive funds from renewable development accounts. Grants to accelerate the development of electric school buses, low-income community uh, solar programs, solar garden programs. Um, we commend work on uh, the compensation for PUC uh, proceeding uh, proceeding participants um, authorized authorized at the PUC in order to uh, in order of, hmm, to order a public utility to compensate Minnesota residents, uh, certain nonprofits, and uh, local uh, native tribes who materially assist the commission in a public uh, PUC hearing. Uh, we can't support the sunset provision. In our opinion, giving the most vulnerable uh, the opportunity to have a voice uh, in crucial decision making only to take it away is unconscionable. Um, consider uh, grants for certified training programs uh, for centers and uh, labor organizations and nonprofits uh, for training and developing programs uh, for careers in weatherization industry, funding to complete infrastructure upgrades necessary to enable electricity customers to interconnected distributed energy resources, establishment of a solar uh, on public uh, buildings Mr. grant. Mr. Mills, um, please, please. Uh, your two minutes is up, but could you please wrap up? I certainly will. Um, finally, we ask you to uh, please include the Senate file 315 requiring utilities to do demographic reporting. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, next, we have Shane Zart and Brand, uh, Brendan Jordan. I'm in touch with Senator Herr on the diversity reporting, and so if you'd like to connect on that, or you can call or whatever, let Senator. me know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zard, please state your, your name for the record and you may proceed. 
Well, thank you, Chair and members. My name is Shane Zart with the firm Flaherty and Hood and speaking today on behalf of the Coalition of Utility Cities, which is a group of seven cities that host the state's largest remaining power plants. And specifically want to thank uh, Chair Frentz and the committee for the inclusion of funding to fund the DEEDS Community Energy Transition Grant Program, which provides grants to these communities to help uh, economic development efforts support the diversification of their tax base as they prepare for the loss of, of uh, uh, tax base that will come along with the, the retirement of the plants that they host. Um, so I know there was some discussion uh, on the other day's committee hearing about uh, the funding in this bill uh, uh, is uh, less than the, the full funding amount, but the, the puzzle has been solved. There was discussion about that. Uh, and uh, uh, between the, the funding in this bill, the funding that's being carried in Senator Champion's bill, and the language that's being being carried in Senator Champion's bill. Um, the entirety of uh, Senate file 1173 is uh, uh, traveling along in one omnibus bill or another. Uh, so thank you again to Chair France and to your, uh, your staff, Committee Administrator Justin Emmerich, for coordinating across committees to help make sure that, that all of those needs were, were recommended. And uh, the, the full uh, combined funding levels between those two bills meets both the, the funding recommendation from both the Coalition of Utility Cities and uh, Governor Walls. So uh, thank you again. And thank you again to Senator Matthews for your work on behalf of the city of Becker in your district, but also host communities generally. And uh, we look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jordan, uh, please state your name and you may begin with your testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Frentz, and members of the committee. My name is Brendan Jordan. Uh, I am here representing Drive Electric Minnesota today. Drive Electric Minnesota is a partnership of EV champions including automakers, auto dealers, electric utilities and cooperatives, local and state government, corporations, and non-governmental organizations working to accelerate electric vehicle adoption in the state of Minnesota. Drive Electric Minnesota uh, strongly supports the inclusion of several important provisions in the omnibus bill that would increase access to, uh, to electric vehicles and EV charging across Minnesota. This includes rebates for the purchase of new and used EVs, grants to support school bus electrification, increased EV adoption by state fleets, and investments by Minnesota's electric utilities in transportation electrification. Uh, however, Drive Electric Minnesota is concerned about the level of funding provided specifically for EV rebates. Um, the $4 million included in the bill is enough to provide uh, about 1,600 rebates for new EVs uh, that's only about a third of the number of electric vehicles sold in 2021. Um, we're concerned that this may set up a bit of a boom-bust cycle where people, uh, once the money runs out every year, people wait till the next year uh, to, uh, to make that purchase, which could, could have the perverse impact, impact of actually uh, suppressing the market. Uh, the money included is significantly less than what was in uh, Senator Mitchell's bill, and we thank Senator Mitchell for carrying this provision and, and less than is in the House. So we would appreciate further consideration by this committee on the, the level of funding to make sure that this truly does accelerate uh, the EV market. Uh, really appreciate the committee's consideration of these provisions and in inclusion of transportation electrification in this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Amber Backus and uh, Mr. Seymour Mansfield. Hello, Ms. Backus. Hello, Ms. Backus. Uh, please state your name for the record, and you may begin with your testimony. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and its 350 franchised and new car truck dealers located in communities across Minnesota. And I would like to echo what Mr. Jordan said. We are very grateful for inclusion of the electrical, electric vehicle incentives and policy provisions from Senate File 1296 that are incorporated into this bill. We especially appreciate the grant funding to assist dealerships become certified by their manufacturers to sell electric vehicles. Besides the cost of installing DC fast chargers and lifts that can hold heavier vehicles, there are also significant utility costs for installing higher capacity transformers and running the electricity to the dealership. Our dealers are served by over 60 utilities, some of whom can assist with these infrastructure costs and some who cannot. The dollars in the bill will be essential to helping all dealers get ready to be a part of the electric vehicle future so no one is left behind. Um, I do want to say that we do have some concerns, though, as well, about the limited funding for the consumer incentives. If the goal is to get more Minnesotans into electric vehicles, the funding must exceed consumer demand. 
Next year, dealers will be required to carry 77% electric vehicles on their lots, yet last year only 3.8% of the vehicles sold in Minnesota were electric vehicles. The funding in the bill gets to less than 1% electric vehicle sales for 2024, which won't move the needle to see the gains required through Clean Cars Minnesota. Ideally, there'd be funding for 12,000 electric vehicles, and maybe uh, the gentleman next to me can help make that happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Beck. Ms. Beck is, uh, Mr. Bansby. I do have a point. Uh, please state your name for yes. the record, and you may proceed. Yes. I'm Seymour Mansfield. I'm uh, the founder and chair of Minnesota Advocates for Nuclear Energy. I do have a point of information, which I hope you won't deduct from my time. Uh, did the committee receive my written testimony? Uh, Mr. Bansfield, yes, we did. You, okay. Well, I don't think that you realize what a historical and profound thing you have done. Uh, for 29 years, there has been a moratorium. For almost all those 29 years, there have been fights where it was passed by the Senate, it was passed by the House, uh, then Representative Waltz um, in 2011 said, please, House, pass the lift of the moratorium. So this is a Gordian knot that has a rather bizarre existence, which has continued for an incredible number of years. And this also includes studies. It's continued for a number of years. So I want to compliment you <clears throat> for finally beginning the work of undoing this Gordian knot. Um, my comments are, first of all, thank you. Uh, we are very appreciative of what the committee has done. Secondly, I would like to ask the committee to stand by this and to fight for this. Because if you don't, it won't get passed. The, the information I have is that House leadership is not in support of this. So to the extent it gets to conference and reconciliation, if you do nothing, nothing will happen. This bill will die and will go on to the 30th year. Uh, secondly, I would like to cover two points that I raised. The first point is I would like to see a minor amendment going back to the original bill sponsored by the chair and sponsored by Mr. Matthews and two other DFL members that there would be a one year time, that is by next year, we would see the study. This study does not require a one and a half year period. And I lay it out in my letter, so I'll leave my letter to speak to that. Secondly, I am fine with the committee, but generally there are some guidelines on what the committee should be consisting of. And I have included those. I think it should be representative. I think it should be quality people. It should come from different places. Native Th Thank you, Mr. Mansfields. Uh, you your two minutes is up. Uh, Senator Friends. Yep. Just briefly, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Mansfield. Looking forward to what is undoubtedly a conference committee process where we'll talk about the advanced nuclear study. But I wanted to, if I could, just briefly come back to Ms. Backus's point. Of course we want to incentivize electric vehicle sales. Um, of course we would like to have had a bigger target, and of course we would love to put more into the incentives. We're going to go into conference and have those discussions. But it isn't just the financial part. We have to demonstrate why those vehicle sales are important if we want manufacturers to send those vehicles to these dealers. I've mentioned to this committee before, in Mankato, it's about a two-year wait um, for an electric pickup, which I would like to have. And we have electric vehicle supply issues, even though our two largest manufacturers, Ford and General Motors, say that by 2035, that will be the only type of vehicle they manufacture. So I'm, I'm supporting Ms. Backus and the 350 auto dealers, but I'm just reminding the committee that ship is coming down the um, canal. Uh, but we have to do more than just provide rebates. We have to demonstrate that we'll commit to infrastructure. We have to look at the ways in which we have that transition. And we have to show Minnesota consumers it's not just a matter of climate change. It's a matter of efficiency, uh, savings on the, the operation of the vehicles in particular. So Ms. Backus has been a very good sport the last few years on this topic. And 
didn't want to let that opportunity pass by, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friends. Uh, next, we have Mr. Beshi, uh, John Beshi, and Mr. Charles Sutton. That ship is coming down the canal. Uh, Mr. Beshi, please state your name and you may proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Beshi, here on behalf of Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. I will keep my comments brief, but there are three main points that I'd like to comment on regarding this bill. First, ABC is opposed to the prevailing wage mandates that are included in this bill. This includes the mandate that prevailing wage be paid on projects that are funded in whole or in part with RDA funds. Prevailing wage mandates increase the cost of labor and result in higher overall costs on construction projects. In addition, there is absolutely nothing in prevailing wage law that requires local workers to be employed on these projects. Second, our members are opposed to the language that would allow the Minnesota Climate Innovation Finance Authority to discriminate against merit shop contractors by requiring projects to implement project labor agreements as a condition of receiving financing. In practice, PLAs require contractors to become signatory for the life of the project, require merit shop contractors to hire union employees at the expense of their own employees, and require merit shop contractors to pay into union benefit funds that their own employees won't ever benefit from. The lack of a PLA does not mean that union workers cannot work. They've successfully been able to work on countless projects across the state without such mandates. Finally, ABC remains opposed to the requirement that the work funded by the Air Ventilation Program Pilot Grants be performed by workers who have either graduated from or are currently participating in a registered apprenticeship program. I won't repeat the concerns that I shared with the committee earlier this week, but I do want to emphasize once again that registered apprenticeship programs are not the sole indicator of quality and safety, and that this requirement will serve as a barrier to merit shops and small and minority-owned contractors who do not participate in these programs. I do want to thank Senator Frantz for taking some time to meet with us yesterday regarding our concerns, and we understand that the goal here is to create a pilot program and to monitor what works and what doesn't. However, we do remain concerned that the inclusion of this requirement will set a precedent and that our merit shop members will see this requirement continue to expand upon other areas of construction. We're also keenly aware of how difficult it can be, be to make a legislative change once a requirement like this has been put into statute. In closing, we are opposed to Senate File 2847 as currently written. We encourage the committee to vote no. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and we are hopeful that our concerns will be addressed as this bill continues to move through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Sun, please okay. state your name and you may begin with your testimony. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Charles Sutton. I'm here on behalf of the North Central States Regional Council of Carpenters and the International Union of Operating Engineers Local 49. Both unions build and maintain our state's infrastructure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the bill. We appreciate the work of Chair Friends and, putting, and staff in putting together this omnibus bill. We believe it is important legislation that will create jobs for our members. We are especially supportive of the inclusion of labor standards, including prevailing wage, across a number of programs. These standards are important for ensuring that investments in clean energy infrastructure continue to support good paying jobs for Minnesota construction workers. We also appreciate the inclusion of reforms to the Community Solar Garden Program. As we stated in our testimony on that bill, we believe this moves the regulation of distribution distributed generation resources in the right direction in a way that balances the need for this type of resource with ratepayer interests. We remain concerned with the expansion of intervener comp as drafted in the bill. While we support the inclusion of more voices in the PUC process, we are concerned that the language as drafted greatly expands the use of ratepayer money to fund advocacy across a wide array of PUC dockets. Lastly, we would express our strong support for inclusion of funding for the Prairie Island Indian community out of the RDA as part of the expansion of the Prairie Island, or as part of the extension of the Prairie Island Nuclear Generating Station. The generating station is perhaps the most important carbon-free asset in Minnesota, and its continued our operation is critical for meeting Minnesota's carbon-free by 2040 goal. It is also a source of good-paying union jobs for Minnesota workers. At the same time, the Prairie Island Indian community has borne the burden of hosting the plant and spent fuel immediately immediately adjacent to their community. Compensating the community is a reasonable and just approach. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Zach Martin. Zach. 
Thank you. Hello, Mr. Martin. Please uh, state your name for the record, and you may begin with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Zhang, uh, Chair Friends, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Zach Martin. I'm the Manager of Government Affairs at Minnesota Power. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. And first, I certainly appreciate all the work uh, that you've all been doing to work hard on this bill. It takes a lot of work and effort to do this, and we uh, support um, all the great conversations we've had this session with you all. Uh, in particular, we greatly appreciate the appropriation for our, a very unique transmission asset owned and operated by Minnesota Power, which is a high voltage direct current transmission line. Uh, this upgrade will improve uh, 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 grid reliability for the entire region, including the state. It will allow us to increase capacity for the transmission line, which is incredibly important uh, when it comes to bringing uh, renewable energy into the state of Minnesota. And it'll also create opportunities for union workers who we are proud to work closely with. Um, it also serves as a keystone um, asset in meeting some of the utility requirements that we're gonna have um, as we approach 2040. And it also strengthens our federal application to the US Department of Energy, uh, which we uh, submitted a couple weeks ago. And we also want to support uh, the feasibility study for the iron-based battery storage. We think that's an incredible, unique opportunity um, that could bring uh, quite a bit of economic opportunity into the iron range. So thank you very much for all the work that you've been doing, and I appreciate your time. Thank you for mentioning Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin. Looks like that will uh, round up all our testifiers on the list. Is there anybody <clears throat> from the public that would like to also... Uh, testify on the bill. Going once, going twice. Uh, Senator Friends, do you have any comments before we go to member uh, questions? Um, no, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I mean, there are some individual items I, I, we could probably talk about, but maybe I'll wait till after we amend the bill or listen to the amendments or whatever we got cooking. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. All right, uh, to the members, uh, Senator Rurick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Frentz, for bringing the bill. A number of good things. Uh, we do have a couple of concerns, so um, I would like to offer the A-17 amendment. Senator Rurick offers the A-17 amendment, and is it in the packet? Oh, it's being passed out right now. Would you uh, be willing to go over the amendment as it's being passed out. Senator Rarick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this, um, one of the concerns uh, we have is in Article 3, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> it's the piece uh, strengthening Minnesota homes. Um, as we looked at this, we, this is an insurance provision and believe that should be in the jurisdiction of the Commerce Committee. And so what this amendment would do would be to strike the language from this bill and then because there's an appropriation, uh, we're, it reappropriates that money to the EV and uh, the school bus uh, grants because we also have a concern that uh, we're using ratepayer money to uh, pay for those grants. And so this would um, then use general fund dollars uh, for paying for those grants rather than electric utility ratepayers. Uh, thank you, Senator Rarick. We have your amendment here, uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rarick. We have a lot of the same thoughts on this. I'd like to ask members to vote no on the amendment, but I am open to those conversations. And as you are sitting right next to the Commerce Committee Chair, I'm guessing that he would be willing to at least engage us on some of this. I think uh, you know our logic for the way the bill is written now is based on juggling some priorities. And so I appreciate the amendment, open to further conversation, but would ask for a no vote on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. Uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, the, I appreciate that, uh, but I would ask members to support this. I still believe that this belongs in the Commerce Committee. All right, with that, uh, any would, further comments? And I would request a roll call, please. Senator Rarick requests a roll call. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would uh, speak in support of uh, Senator Rarick's amendment. You know, now the government wants to come into the insurance industry and say you've got to give lower uh, premiums if we build the building in a certain way. The market will decide that. 
I mean, the, you have actuaries and underwriters who will decide if the risk is not there, they'll lower the premium. We don't need government to micromanage every aspect of our economy. In fact, the more they get involved, the higher the cost and the more uh, uh, fraud and waste that comes out of it. You know, so I just encourage members to vote for this. It belongs in the Commerce Department and actually doesn't belong anywhere. The market will decide. If you build a good building and the risks are reduced, you're going to get a lower premium. It's that simple, okay? Thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Any further comments from the committee members? Uh, so with that... Uh, we will go to the roll call on the A-17 amendment. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunhagen? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Klein? Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. Senator Dibble? Senator Hoffman? Oh, thank you. Um, Senator Dibble is currently walking on his way, and Senator McCune just got here. Travis, you may proceed with the roll call. Senator Dibble. Senator McEwen. There being six yes votes and seven no votes, the motion does not prevail. All right, with that, uh, Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And continuing on the theme of uh, the idea of extra costs to ratepayers, I will offer the A16 amendment. Senator Rarick offers the A16 amendment. Uh, Senator Rarick, uh, could you go over your amendment with us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. As that's being handed out, there are four sections of the bill that uh, we believe will increase costs to ratepayers. And so this would delete those. Uh, it is from the EV bill, the portion where we just tried to increase the funding for the general fund dollars um, by saying, if you look, let me, I'll get to it. If you get to page 45, uh, the cost recovery piece for the EVs and then um, the second part, uh, 51, for the uh, school bus piece, uh, the compensation uh, for the uh, PUC proceeding participants, and then also the benchmarking. We believe each one of these is, is going back onto rate payers at a time where they're gonna, uh, as we heard in testimony today, already seeing increasing rates. Uh, so this would just remove the portions that would be increasing rates uh, for energy users. All right, uh, Senator Friends. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Rarick. I see we're working through this. I would like to request a roll call, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends, uh, request a uh, roll call on the amendment. And, and to the amendment Senator, itself. Senator Friends. Um, Senator Rarick, you have a great sense of these things. We're trying to balance the ratepayer cost with the benefit conferred, whether it's electric vehicles, electric buses, or intervener comp. Um, again, stay tuned on intervener comp. Those are ongoing discussions. And your concern is that we not have a bunch of ratepayer money go out for interventions that aren't in the public interest. Just so I covered that part of it, Senator Rarick. 
um, we're trying to have the interveners fill out the record at the PUC, and I think there's a value to that. It's okay if we disagree on that today. I appreciate the amendment very much, but would ask members to vote no on it to allow further conversations to take place. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Rarick, can you follow up? Um, any other member comments? All right, with that, we will go to the roll call vote on the A16 amendment. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunhagen? Yes. Senator Hoffman? Senator Klein? No. Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. Senator Hoffman? There being six yes votes and seven no votes, the motion does not prevail. Um, next up, any other members? Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll offer the A15 amendment. All right, Senator Matthews, to your A15 amendment as it's being passed out. Uh, Senator Matthews, to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the A15 amendment is going to delete uh, the EV minibus section uh, out of the bill. Uh, it's been problematic. We had a pretty robust discussion on it when it was heard in this committee. But there's two main concerns of how this bill is, again, uh, seeking to increase the cost of energy, uh, which has been a theme on this committee from the blackout bill uh, through to the omnibus, uh, where fees are just getting passed off uh, to ratepayers, and there are two uh, main aspects. Uh, one is it's going to uh, require uh, agencies to buy the most expensive vehicles available, with the priority order now going from electric vehicles to hybrids. Uh, all the way down to gas and diesel vehicles being the lowest priority. Uh, and this is going to come on taxpayer dollars. Uh, there's an argument to be made we shouldn't be buying hardly any bureaucrats' vehicles with state dollars. They should be able to drive their own uh, personal transportation vehicles like the rest of us do. Uh, but uh, we buy a bunch of vehicles, and now uh, this bill is going to make those vehicles be the most expensive vehicles that we buy uh, for bureaucrats, and that's problematic uh, to a lot of Minnesotans. And secondly, uh, the EV rebate program. Um, Mr. Chair and members, we did some math, and that can be difficult for uh, legislators to do sometimes, uh, but it's really important when, you're, uh, when we're spending uh, the way that we're spending here this year. Uh, if you're doing the math, the average electric vehicle price is about $58,000 and change. Uh, so it will be a majority of people getting the rebate will be purchasing an electric vehicle around the $60,000 cap uh, that's in the bill. Uh, the median household income in Minnesota is $77,000. Uh, the per capita income is about $41,000. Um, so are we truly going to expect people uh, to buy a vehicle with a rebate that will still be close or all of an entire year's worth of salary. Uh, hard to see that happening in large numbers. It will likely be uh, the very wealthy that will be getting rebates from taxpayer and ratepayer dollars. Um, I have not been able to buy an electric vehicle. It's cost prohibitive for me, uh, but I will be paying 
uh, for other rich people to get a rebate for their electric vehicle. Uh, and even if you do the math for the amount for low-income Minnesotans, the math still doesn't add up. Uh, there's a $500 rebate uh, for, um, for the low-income and the, the lower-used vehicles. And the low-income uh, range in Minnesota runs around still $21,000 uh, annually. And the uh, cheapest electric vehicles still run around that twenty dollars to $25,000 range. So no matter if we're targeting low income, middle income, uh, the, the, how it matches up still looks to be about people will be spending a year's worth of their salary, give or take, with a bit of a rebate coming from uh, taxpayer and ratepayer dollars. So um, we're bringing that here. Uh, we had a thorough debate on this bill uh, when it was brought in committee. Uh, still a lot of problems with it, still a lot of uh, increased cost to taxpayer and ratepayers uh, for the wealthiest Minnesotans to get a rebate on their electric vehicle purchases, and it's still not something uh, that I've supported. So I ask members to support the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Friends. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Matthews. I know cost has been a driving concern, especially for a lot of us on the committee from Greater Minnesota. My take is that the savings available with electric vehicle transition is worth it. In the same way, members, that we saw statistics out of the national energy numbers yesterday that suggest that the cost is coming down for renewable energy, I believe a fair interpretation is that the cost is going to continue to come down for electric vehicles. But I'd add, uh, Senator Matthews and Mr. Chair, we have the Minnesota auto dealers up here, which I think do represent a good cross-section of Minnesota, asking for us to increase the electric vehicle rebates and suggesting that we have not put enough into Senator Mitchell's bill. And so while I respect those points, um, I would just say right now the Chevy Bolt is 30000 sticker price with a $7,500 federal rebate, and we're looking at 2500 at the state. I think a $20,000 new electric vehicle is in the ballpark for working men and women of Minnesota. And for all those reasons and a couple others I didn't mention, I'd ask members to vote no on the A15 amendment. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like we have Senator Gruenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I would urge support of uh, Senator Matthews' amendment. You know, just a couple things, members. Number one, uh, take a look at Europe. Europe is going away from electric vehicles, okay? They went much further into this than what we have, and they found out it's a disaster, economically and otherwise. So we should not be going down a path of failure. We should be uh, restraining ourselves from going that direction, and I think Senator Matthews' amendment speaks to that. Secondly, um, you know, what's the replacement of the batteries in these uh, battery-powered vehicles, okay? Well, I talked to a salesman, and he said, uh, a car salesman, he said it's approximately two-thirds of the value of the car. So if you pay $70,000 and the battery goes bad, you're going to pay, you fix the battery, is going to be two-thirds of the price of the original car. I mean, that's cost prohibitive on this stuff. And, the, uh, and then you have the uh, disposal of the battery, which is going to cause an environmental disaster in many cases. So for that reason and many others, which I won't state, please vote yes on Senator Matthews' amendment. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just, uh, obviously this was my bill. I would like to speak in favor for it. I would also like to correct something for the record that the European Union actually is going the opposite direction as what was testified on. They have banned all new combustion engines as of 2035. So they have doubled down on electric. And Minnesota wants to be one of the states that has the electric infrastructure. There are cars that cost under 30000 that are electric, very affordable for families that want to jump on board without spending a big chunk of their paycheck. So um, we've heard from our residents that they want this, and I'm excited about it, and I'm glad to see it in the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, next, Senator Matthews. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, electric vehicles have been sold for a number of years, uh, will continue to be sold, um, but it's all these 
additional mandates and requirements that's where government's forcing this in the wrong direction. And I'm glad, Mr. Chair, that you're citing the auto dealers and their support and uh, pushing for the increased uh, costs uh, or increased cost of the, the rebates, something that you might look at down the road. Uh, I do wish you were listening to the auto dealers a couple years ago when this whole mess fell in their lap with the California cars rulemaking, uh, which you now have all three branches of government here. You could pass that into statute the way that you should, uh, but it's still being affected uh, through expanded agency rulemaking with bureaucrats going around the legislature. And the, the whole EV setup uh, has just been wrong solution to band-aid a wrong solution to band-aid a wrong solution, and this is just capitulating more of that. Uh, we should let electric vehicles uh, compete with uh, the market. Uh, the cost will come down because of that. Um, there are places where at least how they're built today is still not going to work uh, around rural Minnesota when you're a great distance away from your school and your workplace and, and everywhere else and you're in 20 below weather in the middle of winter. Um, so Minnesota should not be getting into uh, combustible engine bans. Uh, anytime soon, which I fear uh, is this is the road and the pathway we're starting to go down. Uh, but uh, we can we should just wipe the slate clean and allow it to compete in the marketplace. And uh, that's what the A15 amendment is seeking to try to help us get back towards. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, real quick. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just uh, I, I happen to have on the national news driving in here today is where they said. The uh, Europe is starting to back away from the uh, electric vehicles. Okay, so this is a fluid situation. Please vote yes on Senator Matthews' amendment. Um, not seeing any further comments. Uh, we will go to the vote. Uh, all those in favor of Senator Matthews' amendment, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say nay. 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 No. The motion does not pass and the A15 amendment is not adopted. Uh, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have the A11 amendment. Senator Grunhagen moves the, is it A11 amendment? Yep, A11. Uh, Senator Grunhagen, would you like to uh, give us a rundown of your amendment as they are passing out copies of your amendment? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and basically what this does, it eliminates uh, your bill, Senator Zong, uh, 2301 on the Green Bank, a quasi-government lending institution. Now, Senator Zong, you know I like some of your bills. I even signed on to one, okay? This isn't one of them, all right? Uh, you know, you're going to get the government involved in giving loans for... Uh, uh, the Green New Deal, or Green Bank it's called. Well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let me just give you one illustration. I could give you several, but those of you who remember Solyndra, that was a uh, Obama administration federal guaranteed loan of over $500 million out in California. A actually, it's $570 million. Well, what happened? Well, by the time they were done, they went bankrupt. <laughs> under this, because what happens when you have government get involved with the lending institution, you replace sound economic underwriting principles with an agenda or an ideal, ide an ideal. In other words, we forget, we don't measure the risk properly, we give out this money because we're supportive of a particular agenda, and the result is, time and time and time again, we drive up the cost, and we end up in bankruptcy. So in 2011, Solyndra, after the 535 million was spent and the executive rats left the ship, guess what they did? They declared bankruptcy and the taxpayer wound up holding the bag. So this smacks of the same agenda, members. So let the private market, if you want to incentivize the private market to do some of these loans, it's one thing. To get the government, a quasi-government, involved in making <clears throat> loans where an agenda or a, uh, a green religion becomes the, the, the driver of the loans, 
all you're doing is looking at duplicating something like Solyndra, where the top people make a lot of money, the place goes bankrupt, and then they, they leave with the money and the taxpayer picks up the bag. So what this amendment does is eliminates this out of the uh, bill, and I'm very hopeful uh, that uh, uh, Senator Friends will support the amendment. Thank you. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Not likely. Um, members, what I heard is government uh, should not get involved with lending institutions. And I want to report to you that this morning in the Finance Committee, where I'm proud to serve as the Vice Chair, we passed the $50 million Rural Finance Authority. As all of us know in both parties, the Rural Finance Authority provides beginning farmer loans, um, guarantees independent lending institutions, provides for livestock infrastructure, including buildings, and it passed, I believe, unanimously with all GOP and DFL votes. That's an example of the government working with our lending institutions and our rural banks, of course, um, take the loan guarantees from us. I was a proud yes vote on the Rural Finance Authority refunding because I think for rural Minnesota, that is the relationship that our government should have with the lending institutions. And I would say, um, Senator Grudig, and I share your concern about finances. I see the fiscal conservative in you. I kind of like it. But just to compare, the Rural Finance Authority reported to us this morning the rate of failures or non-payment on the loans. Only 28 out of 3,200 rural finance guaranteed loans went under. In other words, we had a bad debt expense far below a typical commercial banking relationship. And while I respect your concerns about the Green Bank, I feel the same principles apply, that we can do this in a responsible way. And what we're really looking for is to leverage those dollars, and that includes the federal dollars. One of my sensitivities has always been Minnesota is a net payer in to Washington, D.C., we send more money to Washington, D.C. than we get back out. And the Green Bank is an opportunity to have federal funds come to fund clean energy projects. And I'd rather see the money come to Minnesota than go to Oklahoma or New Jersey or Oregon. And with that, members, I would ask you to respectfully vote no on the A11 amendment. Thank you, Senator Friend. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that response. I still maintain we'd all be better off if we allow the market to decide, and when government gets involved, the price of everything, especially with subsidies, goes up. And uh, if we incentivize them through the tax code or other ways, they would take care of it in a much more efficient and effective way. And here again, we're going down the road of uh, getting government involved in lending at a time where um, we see the banks are stressed already. We had, the, what, the second and third largest banks fail in about 24 to 48 hours, and based on bad loans, and this simply sets us up for going down a similar path. So I appreciate your intention, but I, I sincerely believe by incentivizing the market rather than getting government involved into a lending institution, we'd be far better off and we'd avoid situations like Solyndra. Please vote yes. And I'd like a roll call. All right, with that, uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members, for indulging this discussion. It's important. Senator Grunang and you and I share a border. We are looking for the next generation of farmers to come into land ownership to farm and make us proud. The beginning farmer loans in the Rural Finance Authority are the same as the Green Bank loans. We have to have that boost up, that step up to get started. And in the same way, I know you and I wouldn't want to go into the rural parts of our district and say we're cutting off the beginning farmer uh, benefits of the Rural Finance Authority. I hope you'll see the structure of the Green Bank the same way, even if the goals of it are somewhat different. With that, I promise to stop, Senator Grunhagen, unless you want to continue. Uh, then we'll go to Senator Green, and then we'll come back to you, Senator Grunhagen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to Senator France. I think there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the two uh, things that you're mentioning there. For, first of all, the beginning farmer uh, loans is a is a great uh, loan program, but it's there because the government has come in and put so many uh, regulations and stipulations on farmlands, uh, the farm practices, and that continues to grow and grow and grow. And where we got in the farming community is because of government intervention, they have no choice. There's no possible way that anyone can come in and begin a new farm without uh, government help because the government has imposed too many regulations. This is, this is slightly different. 
what we're do what we're dealing with here now is uh, a different kind of a loan program that's coming out of nowhere. No one is no one is stopping the these. Uh, things from going forward, what the government is doing here is saying they're too cost prohibitive to move forward on, therefore we're going to subsidize them. So it's two different things. Uh, we're coming back to you, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Senator Green took the words right out of my mouth. All right, with that we will go to the roll call on the A11 amendment. Senator Friends? No. Senator Zhang? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Dibble? No. Senator Green? Yes. Senator Grunhagen? Yes. Senator Hoffman? No. Senator Klein? No. Nope. Senator Lucero? Yes. Senator McEwen? No. Senator Mitchell? No. Senator Port? No. Senator Rarick? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. All right, there being six yes votes and eight no votes, the motion does not prevail. Um, Mr. Next Chair? Up, oh, Senator Lucero. I will offer the A13. Senator Lucero offers the A13 amendment. Um, Senator, Senator Lucero, would you like to give us a summary on the bill as they are passing it out? Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So whether it be the conversation we just had on the previous amendment, the, the banking amendment, whether it be uh, K through 12 or other uh, spheres of influence in education and other institutions, whether it be the tax code, the energy code, What's been happening for a number of years now is these different codes and these different institutions of influence have been used by proponents of this view of human caused global climate change to socially engineer the public. And it has created a mindset of manufactured demand. And I've heard it a number of times in this committee and in other places that we're just responding to the, the voice of the people. Well, that's been the voice of the people that, again, is part of a, a larger campaign to, to socially engineer in one direction. And this bill before us, this, this DE, I should say, is part of that continued attempt to use government to engineer. So what this amendment does, it's specifically addressing the benchmarking of commercial buildings and to strip that out of the bill. What I'm very concerned about is I've seen in other topics, not just energy, but other topics where there is a group of people out there that are influenced and are willing to go and uh, be abusive and dangerous in certain areas to socially pressure groups that have opposing viewpoints to conform to them. And this, this portion of the bill, it is seeking to create a centralized database that forces commercial building owners now, 50,000 square feet and above, to capture certain data, have her reported not only to the government, but then make certain portions of it available to the public. And I, I am firmly uh, committed to the concern that that information publicly available is going to be used to create public pressure on those. Now, I say now it's 50,000 square feet and above, but in the future, I absolutely know the way that the government has work, been working here is to incrementally reduce that square footage. And in the future, it'll be smaller square footage commercial buildings, and eventually it'll be uh, a continued growing of all types of buildings. And I have a very big concern about that. So that's, I, there's a lot more I could say about this, but essentially it's to strip it so as to not put those, not to allow Minnesota code to require the publicizing of proprietary and private information so that it could be used and abused by certain groups to socially pressure the owners of buildings into conforming to the will of others. So I encourage a green vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Lucero. I'm gonna agree with you in two areas. 
First of all, we have to determine as elected officials which Minnesotans we think are being reasonable and which ones may be a little bit further down the line. And I, I'm sure you do a good job of that in your district. I try to do a good job of that in my district. The Minnesotans I'm listening to have expressed the opinion that we got an issue with climate change, that it is man-made, and it's okay if we disagree. I'm asking members to vote no on the A13 amendment for the second reason, which is the other thing we do here is try to juggle the public benefit versus the public burden, right? We're doing that all the time in this committee. I think the public benefit here is that there's carbon emission reductions to be had if we learn a little bit more about buildings. And I'll just share with you, Senator Lucero, I have a cousin, Tony Friends, more like a little brother, who owns a number of commercial buildings in Mankato. And I will just say that I would love to get the two of you together because I think you'd find some agreement but um, he's not up here, I am, and trying to advocate for what I think is best for the state as a whole. And if we're all in this together, I think the benefit outweighs the burden and looking forward to working with you on these kinds of issues going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Lucero, follow up. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wish that there was another way we could go about this and maybe capturing this information for a public benefit. And I, and I believe that you're genuine in that. But I wish there was a way we could do it and not make it posted publicly available. Is there other mechanisms that could be used? Because again, I'm very concerned about the, the security and safety of those. And I'm not trying to be partisan in my remarks of which groups are you know, dangerous to others, but it's because it's happened on both sides. But I just, I have a genuine concern about that. So thank you. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Lucero. We have looked at voluntary reporting, and I think that should be part of the conversation. The, the question is, if you allow voluntary reporting, does that create a, a sort of a cherry-picking situation where we don't get the true representative sample? I'm very open to those discussions with you going forward. And again, I think we're trying to balance burden versus benefit. We do that all the time in state government. I hear they do it in Washington, D.C., and even though I'm asking for a no vote on the A13, I would uh, welcome any of those conversations going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator. Senator Lucero, any other members? Uh, with that, Senator Lucero moves the A13 amendment. All those in favor of the A13 say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. No. The motion does not pass. Um, any other members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to offer the A14 amendment. Senator Green offers the A14 amendment. Uh, Senator Green, would you like to give us a summary on the bill as we're passing it out? Certainly. Um, starting on page, I believe it's 22, uh, with uh, Article 4, uh, my, what my amendment does, it actually just deletes Section 1. Uh, and what this is, is in this portion, it's, uh, well, it's doing a lot of things. It's, it's establishing a task force, but it's actually going to, going to have to uh, look at and analyze uh, products that are used in not only buildings, but the buildings that uh, Senator Lucero was talking about with the 50,000 square feet, but also on our roads and, and other, other places. I believe if I'm reading this right, uh, on anybody that gets uh, bonding money, state money, that this is going to have to be uh, imposed upon them. Uh, just a little background, uh, I've worked on some of the stuff for the Department of Transportation before and uh, also with some of the commercial and residential buildings. And uh, even though it's a little more complicated than this, as a general rule, you're going to see an increase in price on almost everything that we do that, that state dollars touch are about, of about 25% increase in the cost of those uh, projects. So if you look at transportation, for instance, when we are constantly scrambling for uh, um, more money for our transportation, we're talking about potholes all the time. If, if we could cut back on our regulations, uh, we could essentially do 25% more projects with the money that we have out there now. What this bill is doing in this Article 1 is, uh, or Article 4, Section 1, is going to increase that price even more. You're going to put burdens on manufacturers, whether that be carbon steel, concrete, which, uh, and, and even asphalt is mentioned in here. So it's going to affect every building, every road, and we're going to get less money out there on real projects, which means less jobs, and uh, quite frankly, it could mean inferior products as well. So I will stand for questions on this amendment, but I would uh, 
hope that you look into this and consider this. This is not something that has to be in this bill. If there's other ways to go after and look at these issues, we could do that. Um, I think that uh, we're just uh, we're just asking for less projects in the long run. Thank you. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green. If we get less project, then this portion of the bill failed, and I agree with you that what we're trying to do is make smart decisions. As I mentioned with Senator Lucero, I think the question is, what's the value of the information that we're going to get versus the burden? In my opinion, um, what we're getting is more valuable than what we're giving, but I respect what you're saying, which is you think we're going to reduce the all number, overall number of projects, and if that proves to be true, um, you can have me uh, take responsibility or eat my hat or whatever the right way to handle it is. For that reason, members, I would ask for a no vote on the A14 amendment. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, Fr uh, Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator France, uh, you know, this, it's good talking points, I guess, but the fact is that we know this is going to drive up costs. We know that it will. And with limited amounts of money, unless, unless we just had a, a pool of money coming in, we're going to get less projects. And there's, there's other ways to do this, uh, I think, without imposing these things on us right away. Uh, another task force, for instance, do we really need another task force? Can't, can't existing agencies go out and, and collect this as, as they're going forward? Um, this bill itself, I think this portion of the bill, if I'm looking through the numbers right, it's probably like a million dollars to, to start this. But that's just a small portion of what this is going to cost us in the long run. So um, I'm not going to ask for a roll call. I don't think that's necessary. I do want to make the point, and I will, I will hope that uh, people will consider voting yes for this. It's not like it has to be in here. It's not, the bill's not going to fall apart without this. And there's other ways to go about this without putting more burden on our manufacturers. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Uh, any other member questions or comments? Uh, with that, Senator Green moves the A14 amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Nay. No. The, the A14 amendment does not pass. Uh, with that, any other members with amendments? Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Um, this is a great committee with a lot of good ideas, and I'd like to say I think we have a good balance here. Um, we, we don't have in the majority party any, um, you know, monopoly on good ideas, and I, I want to highlight a couple things that we've talked about here and then ask for members to support the bill. First of all, we did not get into community solar. Sorry. Do you want me to hesitate? Mr. Sorry. Chair? Sorry, uh, Senator Friends. Did you want to wait for uh, closing comments uh, after the members have gone or... Is this an intermediary comment? You know what, Mr. Chair? I would be happy to wait for closing comments. I kind of thought friends. maybe we were to that part already. <laughs> All right. So, sorry about that. Uh, any member comments? Um, we'll save the uh, committee lead and the chair for the end. Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Matt. Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you, Senator Frentz, for having a willingness to discuss things. Now, I disagree with some of your conclusions after the discussion, <laughs> but there are a couple things that I do uh, like in the bill. The, the uh, nuclear study is one, that you're taking uh, a, an attempt to try to address some of the abuses in the solar gardens. I hope you're successful. I will support you on that uh, any way I can because I, I consider there's a lot of abuse in the solar garden program. Um, you know, I do have to take issue with a couple things, uh, probably about 15, but I'll only say a couple. <laughs> you know, you said the price of alternative energy, energy coming down. Well, I just checked right before this meeting what the uh, uh, solar garden price of electricity is. And the average, again, there's some plus or minus there, but the average, according to the, uh, the individual who knows, uh, who gave me this, uh, is about 13.3 cents per kilowatt hour. A year or so ago, it was between 11 and 12 cents. So it's going the wrong direction. The market rate a year ago was 4 cents. And we're artificially inflating it up to about 13.3 cents. And as you well know, the majority of ownership, 67% last year at least, was owned by people out of the out of state, including Warren Buffett, and I'm sure he's doing it out of the, 
the uh, goodness of his heart, uh, these solar gardens, and and 20% was owned by foreign corporations. So we're artificially inflating the price of electricity, fleecing the Minnesota ratepayers, business farms and, and citizens and low income people and transferring the money to the wealthy through these solar garden programs. Besides the fact that it's not base load electricity. You know, I just consider this climate uh, change argument. You know, we started out with in the late 60s, early 70s, the planet was going to freeze over again. We were going to have a, a, icebergs coming down here in the, in the United States. In fact, there was a front page article in the time. Then we went to Al Gore, uh, global warming. Everything's going to melt. Florida's going to be underwater. California's going to be underwater, big parts of it in New York. And of course, Al Gore buys a house right on the ocean down in California, so you begin to wonder what's going on. Uh, and then, you know, we can't predict what the weather's going to be three months from now, but we can certainly predict what's going to happen, you know, 50, 60, 70 years from now. I'm sorry, I just got a hard time buying that. And there's literally hundreds and thousands of scientists who signed a petition on this CO2 uh, global warming agenda that it's anti-science and anti-environment. I know in the past I've said that when we have to clean these windmills and solar up, that it's going to be an environmental disaster. And I think your response at the time is, well, we can replace them. Yeah, but you still have the refuse of the things that don't work. Check California out. They don't know what to do with all this stuff. It's an environmental disaster. That's what we're setting up here. The last point I'll make is this. Oh, well, I'll make two quick points. One, nuclear waste can be recycled. Do your research between 90 and 97 percent the technology, and we're not doing it. It doesn't have to sit and cause dangerous situations, and it provides base load electricity. Second thing is, I talked about a map, and I said uh, that showed where uh, solar was economically viable. And you mentioned two states, California and Arizona. Well, according to the map, which by the way came from a retired XL uh, plant manager who is a mechanical engineer, and he was the North Star Electric Director until he uh, retired, he sent me this map. And he basically said, this is a, it isn't the Green New Deal solar, it's the Greed New Deal. A few people are making money and the rest of us are paying for the show. But on that map, it does show that Arizona and California are an area where it could have some economic viability as long as there's some base load electricity to supplement it. When you get to Minnesota, it's not. Most of the northern part of the country, solar panels are not economically viable for what they produce because of the changing seasons. So again, this was put out by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that put these maps out. So I think we have to get back to true science and care about the environment rather than go down and, and, and you know, an ideologue perspective without considering what the consequences are. Again, there's a couple things in your bill I strongly support but the majority of it should be sunsetted. And the last thing, I know I said it once before and then I'll quit, Mr. Chair. You know, I don't think this bill is in there, but uh, we heard SF 1173 and what that does, it, on the handout that was given, it talks about closing the largest coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants in our state. And the negative impact it's going to have on communities like Becker, Oak Heights, and Cohasset uh, because they're to retire between 20 and 35. It's going to reduce the local property taxes in those communities 40 to 70 percent. Then it goes on to say we have to provide funding to these cities, government funding to make up for this loss of uh, property tax revenue by closing these plants. So see, first the, go the government passes the law to cause the problems, and then they come back and they have empathy and say, well, we caused all that problems for you. Here's a bunch of money. We hope it helps you out in the planning. I mean, <laughs> honest to God. 
that's what, unfortunately, government does. And that's why socialism doesn't work. And unfortunately, this bill is filled with this type of philosophy. Again, we should be taking money and hardening our electrical grid for an EMG attack. We just had a Chinese balloon float across the United States. If that had a nuclear device, it could put us back to the, to the late 1800s overnight. That's where we should be spending money. And I do appreciate you got a little bit of money in here for resiliency to the grid. But we need much more. We need to harden our electrical grid so we don't go back to the, the, uh, to the late 1800s overnight. So I, you know, I do appreciate some of your efforts, but I can't support this bill. And I hope the majority of this uh, committee will come to their senses and vote no. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, Senator Wood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as it relates to Senate File 2847, like any omnibus bill, there's good points and there's not so good points. And, um, and of course, I mentioned the other day one of the provisions that is in this bill uh, prohibits many of my businesses and my workers from actually uh, being able to install many of these projects and that have state dollars attached to them. Um, you know, quite frankly, uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Frantz, I, I visited with many of the unions uh, almost two months ago and, and voiced my concern about this issue and the fact that the prevailing wage, wage law of Minnesota does not work. Uh, and has is, uh, been figured inappropriately for many of the areas of the state. Uh, to date, what I've heard is nothing. And as long as a bill is going to prohibit my businesses and my workers uh, from being able to participate, uh, there's many other reasons why I, there are things in here that I don't like. But uh, until that problem gets solved, uh, Mr. Chairman, I cannot and I will not vote for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Weber. Any other members? Senator McEwen. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, um, Chair and Senator Friends, for um, this bill. I, um, I will say that, you know, as as some have already said, there are uh, some things that they're really happy with, some things that maybe they're not happy with, and this represents a lot of compromise. I know that it does, and I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, I, I will be proud to, to support this bill, um, knowing that I may not see everything that I would like to see, but I am overall very pleased with the progress that we're making and the work that has gone into a compromise like this. Um, I also just want to put a shout out uh, and, and how pleased I am to see, well, there's a number of things, but I'm very happy to see uh, the electrical school bus uh, provision in there. Uh, we know that communities around our state want to make these differences. I've had meetings with, and I'm sure you have, with young people throughout the state asking about things just like this. How do we get solar on our schools? How do we change it so that our, our buses are electric? All these pieces, they want to do these things. So that is our job, to help make those things possible and achievable for our local communities and the people of Minnesota. So thank you for this bill, Senator, and um, all, these, all these good provisions. Uh, thank you, Senator McEwen. Uh, Senator, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll just echo uh, what Senator McEwen has to say. Thank you, Senator Frentz, uh, for this bill. I think this is a great follow-on to the 2040 bill. Um, we can avoid those blackouts through this bill that Senator Grunhagen keeps warning us about because we will uh, be investing in, in a lot of the uh, services, programs, technology, um, that allow us to bring that the fulfillment of the uh, uh, aspirations and values and ideas in that bill um, uh, to the fore. And so, um, you know, this is a great bill. I even like the nuclear piece because that's going to give us information that we need. Uh, and uh, information is, yep, he's writing it down. Um, information is never anything to be afraid of. <laughs> um, what, what, what did Senator Grunhagen say? I like a couple of things in this bill. There's a couple of things I don't like in this bill, but I like the bill a lot. You know, of course, I especially like you know, resilient buildings and, and, funding and supporting uh, uh, certs. Um, 
happen to be my ideas. Uh, those are those are great. Um, but you know, electric buses, solar on public buildings, uh, you know, making sure our state fleets uh, 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 move towards uh, electric uh, energy. Um, you know, uh, just uh, it's, a, it's a package of good ideas, like I said, is a good follow on to the 2040 and will help us achieve and fulfill the aspirations of that bill. So thank you, Senator Friends. Thank, uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Senator, thank you for uh, bringing this. You, this num my number one pick for, for committees this year was this bill, this, this committee. And I, I appreciate the work. Uh, I, I am missed when I say I was upstairs cutting services to people with disabilities or elderly just to try to make things work. And so if I, I have not been able to say how grateful I am for the work that you're doing and the leadership that you're doing because of the fact that you have an open door policy and people can get to you and talk to you. And really, this is how it should be done in energy. And that's why I wanted to be back on this. So thank you for all your hard work. And thank you for listening to people. And thank you for being a, a worker on that. So thank you for this bill. Uh, before we go to Senator uh, Matthews and Senator Friends, um, I just want to take this moment to thank you, Senator Friends, for leading us in this effort. Uh, like Senator Hoffman, this was my first choice uh, of committees to serve on. Uh, thank you for giving me, the, me and other members the opportunity uh, to work on this bill, but especially coming from me. Um, you know, I'm the only person of color on this committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to express the views and voices of the communities that I also try to represent um, and being open and working with me and others. And, and to all those in the audience that uh, took the time to work with us, uh, I know my name is on here quite, quite a bit. And uh, I may not have been your first choice, but all of you had worked uh, diligently with me, some more than others. Uh, I like to think uh, others like Senator Grunhagen. I know you don't like all of my bills, but you like some of them. Uh, and I appreciate you being willing to work with me and uh, Senator Rarick, you know, for taking my calls on a Saturday morning uh, to go over the bills, to work through the provisions with me. And so I really appreciate that. Uh, and I look forward to uh, the passage of this bill uh, and to make it better. And so with that, uh, we will go to Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Friends, and committee members. Uh, ironically, yeah, this, this too was my first committee choice when uh, we were getting the committees uh, put together, and it's uh, very, very important to my district, and you learn a lot uh, here uh, on the Energy Committee. And uh, Senator Zhang, I wish my name was on this bill as often as yours is. Uh, unfortunately, we still got a little ways to go. Um, and. This bill uh, has a few good pieces that are in it. I'll go through and highlight a couple of them that are here. Uh, it leaves a lot wanting. Um, and the, the argument made both Monday and today about uh, the bipartisan nature of the bill, it's still very lopsided. And the numbers and the dollar amounts uh, show that. Uh, new money in the bill for GOP bills is 300,000 of general fund money, $2.4 million in RDA money for a total of 2.7 million and change. Uh, new money for governor initiatives and Democrat bills uh, that are in uh, this omnibus bill is $162 million in general fund and $58 million in RDA. So the balance that's in this bill is 321 million to 2.7 million. Uh, we have a bit of work to do uh, to have a bipartisan agreement, a, a true bipartisan work in this bill. Uh, obviously my favorite piece is the advanced nuclear study, which I've authored, which Senator Frentz, you've had me uh, push you on for multiple years now uh, before you chaired this committee. Uh, and that's a good first step in here. Uh, there needs to be more pieces that are in this bill. Uh, there's other nuclear uh, pieces that this committee's heard that's not in the bill. And if you wanna be serious about meeting uh, the 2040 goals, which I believe you are, 
uh, but you're not yet ready to accept all the tools that you'll need in the toolbox. Uh, and that is uh, evident in this bill uh, by what's here and by what's lacking. And, and uh, I agree with some of the testifiers. I have my own doubts as to whether or not it will survive conference committee with the other body. Uh, I hope so, uh, but I guess we'll see. Uh, but this bill, uh, like this committee has done multiple times, is gonna increase costs to ratepayers, to taxpayers, and to uh, the poor and middle income uh, people of Minnesota, uh, and often benefit the wealthiest Minnesotans. Uh, the prevailing wage requirements in pretty much all of the projects is gonna increase the cost of the projects when it should be uh, more competitive. And I'm, I am uh, working on building, being pro-trades and pro uh, non-union workers uh, that are in my district have been trying to work on on uh, helping both sides uh, come together uh, as much as possible in my time here. Um, obviously the Green Bank bill is going to take taxpayer funds uh, for projects that's going to increase taxpayer costs there. The uh, compensation piece is something I've always struggled with because that's going to uh, increase the cost to ratepayers uh, with that provision. Um, there's also a few pieces in the bill that haven't gotten uh, nearly as much attention, but um, things like uh, allotments to agencies uh, to maintain current staff levels such as the PUC, uh, its current budget's about $16.6 .6 million. We're raising it by an additional $3.5 million per biennium to maintain current staff levels, the bill says. So a 21% increase just simply to maintain, uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, the, uh, the second piece that I do uh, like in the bill is the $5 million for the Community Energy Transition Grant Program. The other half is in jobs. I like this piece in the bill. I don't like the state policies that have gotten us to this position, as Senator Gruenhagen uh, highlighted earlier. Uh, government popped the tire, and now they're saying, oh, here's a tire plug for you. And a better solution would to be to not cause the problem to begin with. Uh, so I'm glad that we're going to help our host communities in that way, uh, but it would be better to not uh, be shutting the state's uh, baseload generation down and putting them in this position to begin with. Uh, the EVA rebate program I talked about uh, a lot earlier. Um, the Cenophile 2156 that's in this bill that's going to just raise the cost of buildings uh, by having special requirements on the uh, on the items going in to build uh, the buildings, uh, especially with the supply chain here. Uh, that part doesn't make sense. Uh, Senate file 2295 is in this bill and it's gonna increase the cost of private buildings with the benchmarking tools and the information that's uh, gonna be required to go to government. And then uh, Additionally, um, the governor's budget that was originally in the Senate file 2847 uh, is raising the amount that the Public Utilities Commission can recover from utilities from 500,000 uh, to $1 million. And when you increase the amount that they recover from utilities, that increases the amount that the ratepayers are gonna have to pay for their utility costs. Uh, and then there's finally a provision, uh, again, an increasing uh, staff by 34% in the Commerce Department uh, with eight new FTEs uh, in energy resources and a 34% increase uh, in that area. So this bill uh, spends a lot of money in a very lopsided manner. Uh, it's doing a lot to raise the cost to ratepayers um, and like the electric vehicles and some of these other uh, pieces in here, it's gonna benefit a lot of wealthy Minnesotans and have 
the low and middle income Minnesotans uh, footing a lot of these bills. So there's more work to be done. I hope the committee will keep listening uh, to the ideas uh, that the GOP caucus has been bringing forward. Uh, there's a little bit that's in this bill, but just minuscule amounts right now, and we need to uh, correct that, uh, not only for goals and priorities that we have, but trying to help you meet some of the priorities uh, that you have passed uh, out of this committee. So uh, can't support the bill today, uh, but hoping we can keep working to rectify uh, where this bill is lacking. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Uh, Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Matthews. Thank you, members. I'll try to be brief. I think every point that was raised here today comes from a, a sense of let's do the best we can. This committee has attempted to be open and, and listening, and I think we've done that today, even where we have disagreed, and that's democracy. To the points being made by my friends in the minority caucus, I would just say this. First of all, I consider the co-op and muni grants to be of benefit to primarily GOP districts. You don't have to agree with that. But as we look at cooperatives and municipal electric companies, I put that money in there as a signal that we wanted them to have a little bit of support and to honor our commitment that we would work with investor-owned utilities, co-ops, and munis. And although that wasn't sponsored by a GOP member, that certainly was my tip of the hat to those electric uh, utilities that serve the lower um, population density communities. I'd say, you know, we want to move in towards clean energy. Sounds like we disagree about man-made climate change. That's okay. I'm persuaded. I'm one of 201 legislators. But as the author of the bill, I'm asking us to move in that direction. Many of the bills um, that are represented in this omnibus bill do just that. Among them, electrification of vehicles. I think that's a winner for Minnesotans. And I think it does apply to all income spectrums, including, as I said, the lowest income Minnesotans and the electric vehicle savings that are available, especially on the operational side. A couple of you mentioned intervener compensation. Keep in mind, a lot of those interventions come on behalf of ratepayers. I had it estimated that over $10 million had been saved by those interventions. Our calculation on the intervener cop stuff, although that is a work in progress, is that interventions fill out the record and tend to save ratepayers. I remain concerned about interventions that we're not that excited about. And to your point, Senator Matthews, stay tuned on the intervener comp discussions. We have not talked about the state competitiveness fund, but as you know from the spreadsheet, $115 million is being carried separately, but it is against our target, and that is allowing us big and small utilities to take advantage of federal matching funds and to do things that are good for resiliency, good for cost, and good for reliability. And I have long said in this committee that the boards of the biggest and smallest utilities and everyone in between are in the best position to make judgments about how to use those funds. And I have the feeling that co-ops and munis are going to use those to keep rates in line and to keep resiliency and um, serve the public in the, in the ways that the grants were intended. Um, finally, we talked a little bit about the next generation, and you know we're we're speculating because we don't have a crystal ball. But Senator Grunhagen, you did cite the American Council on Renewable Energy, and I do love the debate with you on the numbers. What the um, president of the Council on Renewable Energy said was over the past decade, the, the levelized cost of wind energy declined by 70 percent, while the levelized cost of solar power has declined by an even more impressive 90 percent. So I'm just asking as we make these decisions and as we focus on cost to look at the facts, which are that the, the cost to the consumers of those two types of energy is plummeting. And I would suggest that the bill puts us in the best position to take advantage of those energies, not just from a cost standpoint, but from what many of us believe is a critical time to reduce carbon emissions. With that, I want to thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for taking the gavel today. I would ask members to vote yes on the file and look forward to voting yes myself. Thank you. And, and then uh, with, the, with that, we'll take a roll call on the, I on the bill. request a roll call, Mr. Chair. Thank uh, you. Roll for call requested. Me. There will be a roll call on the bill to send it to... Uh, to send it over to finance. And so with that, may Stephanie begin? As amended. As amended. Senate, yep. sorry. Senate file 2847, as amended. Senator Friends? Yes. Senator Zhang? Yes. Senator Matthews? No. Senator Dibble? Yes. Senator Green? No. Senator Grunhagen? No. Senator Hoffman? Aye. 
Senator Klein? Yes. Senator Lucero? No. Senator McEwen? Yes. Senator Mitchell? Yes. Senator Port? Yes. Senator Rarick? No. Senator Weber? No. There being eight yes votes and six no votes, the motion prevails. Uh, and the bill is on its way to finance. And with that, the committee is adjourned.